Welcome back to the Ramble. For a lot of y'all, this is nothing new. You know what I'm saying? You've been around. You was here for episodes one through six, and this is number seven. For some of y'all, this is brand new. And if that's the case, I'm slightly, and I'm saying slightly, disappointed because that means you don't follow all the channels. This is a series that had lasted on my Kenny channel that I'm moving over to Kenny for real for reasons that we'll talk about in a couple seconds. But I'll fill you in to what this series is really about. It's something that I started towards the beginning of the NBA bubble where after the games are done or there's big news or something, I come down to the basement, I turn on that camera, I turn on this microphone, and it is a unscripted, unfiltered, opinion-based show where I just kind of ramble. It's literally me rambling about stuff. And it can start at something like LeBron James and somehow we'll be talking about Delaware I don't know how it's a ramble I'm just talking I'm just talking and we go here and people enjoy it for some reason and since they enjoy it I enjoy making it so yeah we're here with another episode it is September 2nd as this episode is going up for people that is asking why is it on this channel not the other channel without sounding too too suspicious or sounding like I did something wrong (laughs) the Kenny channel was under investigation right now I promise you I didn't do anything wrong. It's more on the YouTube side of things, and hopefully they get it figured out relatively soon. But I can't I can't rely on YouTube. It could take a week, months before they figure out what the heck is going on over there. So in that that time period, I didn't want to just sit here and not upload a ramble. So now it exists on Kenny for real because there's nothing going on on Kenny for real. And you know what? The more I think about it, would the ramble series make sense if the name of the series was Kenny for real? Because it's it's Kenny for real, right? You know what I'm saying? I'm it's me with no script, no, no nothing. It's just me being myself and talking about hoops. Hmm. Something we'll think about. This show also exists to try to get another uh show that I can host on House of Highlights or wherever else. I already have one show and I love it, but I want a more talk show oriented show. And this has been my application for the first six episodes. So far, I have not got the attention of my general manager. But Doug, if you're watching episode seven, take notes, baby. I'm about to go in and we're about to have a lot of fun. Um, So we had two games today. Game two of Milwaukee versus the Miami Heat. And then game seven of OKC versus Houston. Uh, that game just wrapped up maybe five minutes ago. My heart is still beating out of my chest. Uh, and again, I'm not associated with any of these two teams, but it felt like I was. And that's exactly what you want from a game seven. But I want to go in chronological order and talk about the first game of the day, even though it feels like it happened so long ago that I don't even remember everything that happened in that game. The main thing, and we're going to all agree on this if you watch that game, is what a terribly refed game. Every time a team loses a game, I get people in my mentor saying, oh, it's the Celtics versus the refs. It's the Raptors versus the refs. It's the 76ers versus the refs. Everybody believes that their team lost the game because of the refs. And I usually disagree. Usually, usually refing is very consistent and overall okay. You know what I'm saying? It's very rare that I'm like, okay, this game was perfectly refereed because it's it's human. It's humans and human make errors. So I'm not I'm not faulting them for that. But today's game, the first game of the day, was a catastrophe when it comes to refing basketball and I am actually so surprised it ended the way it did if you do not know what happened you've been living under a rock I feel you in with a couple seconds left in the game uh the Milwaukee Bucks are down by three they get an inbounds play for Chris Middleton that is four or five feet behind a three-point line he goes up to take a three Gordon Dragic closes out but if you ask me he's going he's literally just raising his hands completely up literally straight up and he gets called for a foul Oh, my God. Chris Middleton knocks down all three free throws. And then I feel as though, and and again, this is an open discussion. I'm just the one with the microphone, but the comment section is the comment section. I feel as though when we get back on the other side of the ball and Jimmy Butler takes that shot, I feel like that was a makeup call because they know that the Goran Dragic call was a mistake. It was a mistake. Goran Dragic literally played defense exactly where you, you would teach a closing out on a jump shot. He didn't get under him. He didn't he didn't lean over. He didn't reach up. It was literally rule of verticality like it was Roy Hibbert like this. And he got called for a foul. Right. You can't you can't negatively uh, uh, give you can't give consequences to good basketball plays. And if you ask me, Gordon Drogic made a good basketball play there contesting the shot straight up. So I believe that the refs gave Jimmy Butler that call because they knew that they screwed up on the other side of the ball. But just the just the whole moment made it seem like you missed two very, very crucial moments of basketball. And you know what made it even worse? Steve Javi. Oh my, can we get him off of the TV screen? 
The man has been out of reffing for almost a decade, and it has not been a single time where they're like, let's let's go see what Steve has to say about this call. There has not been a single time where Steve Javi has been like, no, the refs are tripping right there. The refs got that messed up. Just the refs are 100% right, huh, Steve? I understand they paying you, but, bro, the reason why they have you on the broadcast is to get that that insight that we can't get from the the, the refs on the court. Because, what is his name, Mark Davis? is It's Mark something. The guy that made all the bad calls today in the first game. Mark something. I, I'm completely drawing a blank. We're not going to get him explaining the call. So, Steve Javi's job is supposed to be like, okay, this is why he called that, and, and I disagree with it. It has not been a single time. And you know what? Doris Burke gets a lot gets a lot of hate and a lot of love. I'm I'm a I'm in a love Doris Burke camp, by the way. She went in. She went in on Steve Javi, like, I'm gonna tell you I disagree with that one, Steve. Telling the man straight up to his face, the guy that had refereed for decades. No, you're wrong. Because he was. He was. He was just backing his referee brethren, and that has been a problem. And not just refereeing, but a lot of different professions recently. We're like, no matter what, you're gonna you're gonna back up the brethren that is in the same um, or occupation as you. And it's not always the case. It can be the case. If one of my coworkers is wrong about something, I should be able to openly disagree or tell him that he's wrong, and both of us get better from it. That's like Steve Javi clown 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 i don't want to see him back on my tv screen but i will so yeah they just two very very bad plays and you know what throughout the course of this game there's a lot of fouls called on jump shooter and for majority of them i i agree like it was terrible closing out throughout the entire game but again these two calls at the end of the game when it's four seconds left and when it's zero seconds left those are two very bad calls you know but anyway enough of the refereeing let's talk about the stuff that was actually uh done by the players um, Coach Bud, I guess it's not the players, but Coach Bud, I, it is written in stone at this moment. And you know what? I was giving Coach Bud the benefit of the doubt uh, for another year, but I can't do it anymore. He's just not a good playoff coach. Amazing regular season coach. He has always been with the Atlanta Hawks and now with the, the Milwaukee Bucks. Regular season coaching, mwah, magnificent. You can you can lead a team to the number one seed with your coaching. But eventually, we got to get deeper than that. We gotta get to the playoffs. We gotta get to the conference finals. We gotta get to the finals. You guys are the are the favorite. You can't get eliminated in round two, but right now you are on this trajectory to get eliminated in round two. And again, it's a combination of a lot of things. We're gonna focus on Coach Bud here. The rotations are still very confusing to me. I understand, yeah, like why is Giannis not playing more? He is the MVP of the league. He is your star player, and though the the uh the Miami Heat have done an amazing job guarding him throughout the course of this series, if he is who we say he is, if he is who we think he is, he has to play more minutes. This is playoff basketball, coach. But thirty six minutes, thirty eight minutes is literally not enough for a guy like him. If he has he is as good as he is on the offensive side of the ball, and as good as he is on the defense side of the ball, the win defense player of the year, there's no reason why he shouldn't play 40 minutes a game. Now I understand, and this one he was in and out of foul trouble. Understood. But I'm not even just talking about game two at this point. I'm talking about game one. I'm even talking about the last series. And even though they got out of that in five, you still wonder why the heck is Giannis not playing more? Why is he not playing more? And there were times in this game, and maybe I'm answering my own question here, where the team went on runs without Giannis on the floor. So I guess I am answering my own question. That's why he probably wasn't in the game as much. The teams went on these, these small 8-0 runs, you know, 6-2 runs, you know, just stuff like that to, to get into the game uh, without him on the floor. Man, it's this is, this is going to be a very critical series for Giannis, man. He's starting to get to that point where every star player has gone through this we're like, we, we transition from, oh, it's okay, kid. Uh, you'll get him next year to like, okay, here's let me see some results. Because what I'm seeing from the second round of the playoffs from him is that though he is a very dominant player, if you let him get a full head of steam, if you don't allow him to get a full head of steam, he is going to struggle. He's going to struggle. And he hasn't incorporated things into his jump. You know what? That is, that's cap. Because to the beginning of the season, he was shooting those mid-range jump shots with confidence. And now we rarely see him. I don't know what happened to him over the course of the season, but he was going. He went from a player that, again, it wasn't super reliable, but it was he was doing it enough where teams would have to step out on him, and that opened things up so much more for the entire team if he could step in and take that mid-range jumper, or he can step in and take a three-pointer here and there. And it's got to the point where he has lost all confidence in that. And the one time he did show confidence in his game, he stepped into a three. The dude hit the whole side of the backboard, way off. It's just like, man, Giannis, bro, I'm, again, I root for everybody, but a player like him, I'm exact, I'm really rooting for because the small market teams deserves things like this. But, man, it's, it's, he's making it very hard for uh, his case to be the best player in the NBA if that's the case he wants, you know? So um, Miami did this without Jimmy Butler even having a good offensive game. Again, Jimmy Butler is 
an impactful player, even if he's only scoring 11 or 12 points or whatever it ended up being, um, even though he did almost sell on that one pass. Oh, he almost sold in that one pass. Um, and then he missed a free throw too, didn't he? Oh, also with Giannis, he's just got to be better at the free throw line, man. He just has to be. And like you can see him, he people compare him to Shaq all the time, and he's looking like Shaq at the free throw line. But I, I give a lot of credit to the Miami Heat, from to Eric Spoelstra, to everybody that played minutes in this game, had their own little impact. Tyler Hero, bro, Tyler Hero is so fun to watch. He plays this swagger that that you don't really see from rookies like that. And if you do see it from rookies, it's like the John Morant type rookies. It's not really like the guy that was drafted after 10 plus getting, you know, that type of confidence. And, and maybe that's just the Miami culture. And when I watch the Miami Heat, I'm so jealous. I am so very jealous because of all the culture and everything. But Jimmy Butler's on that team. And he was once on my team. And he's very, very good. And he could have been very good on my team still. But back to Tyler Hero, uh, when I saw him – and saw his shoes, he was hooping in. I was like, you know what? This is going to be a game. He's playing in those Kobe's that released last Mamba week, the undefeated collaborations. I think they were Kobe 5s, the Proto, and maybe somebody in the comment section could correct me if I'm wrong. But they, um, they're the undefeated collaboration. And when I tell you I struck out on those and all the other three Kobe shoes they released in Kobe week or Mamba week, uh, but those are the ones I wanted the most. And if you look at the resale, they're like at $2,000 now. And I'm not making Tyler Hero money, so I will not be getting those undefeated Kobe's. But I saw him on his feet, and I was like, you know what? He's going to have a game, and a game he did have. Um, just Coach coach Bud, the series is not over, obviously. We've seen teams come back from down 2-0. But it's, they're making it very tough for anybody to believe that they can make a comeback. And then we get to the last game of the night, Game 7, Houston Rockets versus OKC. Um, a similar situation in this game, the ref, it was – was bad. It's just overall a bad day for refs. I feel like the NBA has got to this point where, like, we're reviewing so many things. It's just killing the flow of the game. I cannot be the only one, whether it be – like, I'm okay with the coach's challenge. I believe that the coach's challenge can be a very important thing in basketball. I mean, I know it can be very important because if if Gordon Drogic and, and the Eric Spolster and them, if they had their coach's challenge, Chris Middleton don't get those three free throws because the refs are able to review that. And if – Milwaukee hit their coach's challenge. Maybe Jimmy Butler don't get that last one. So, yeah, the coach's challenge could be very impactful. But all of the other stuff, we got to see if this is a flagrant. We got to see if this was unnecessary force. <sighs> it could just kill the whole vibe of the game, especially since it's not just, okay, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Okay, we done in 30 seconds. We're talking four or five minutes are being spent on a play where Cal Corver is just closing out. And, sure, he did get under Chris Middle. No, he, get out, he got under somebody. He got under... Iggy, it was under Iggy, and I'm somehow I transitioned back to game number one, but this is the one that's on my mind right now. Yes, he did get under, and sure, that is unnecessary for sure. If that's the rule book, it's a flagrant. But did you really need to review the play for five minutes to see that? I saw that from the crib as soon as it happened. Like, what the heck is going on? Steve, here, Steve Javi. Yeah, I think that's a flagrant. No, sh yes, we saw it too, Steve. Anyway, getting back to the other game. Um, like I mentioned earlier, my heart was beating crazily throughout these last couple minutes. Game seven, Luke Dort was a, was something, bro. Think, thinking about him, it's just he signed a like four year, five million dollar contract early in this season, and now you, I bet he is kicking himself from signing that long term deal for that amount of money because he has showed how impactful he can be as an NBA player. Um, throughout the course of the series, OKC um, um, Houston has decided to not guard him whatsoever. And though he put up some stinkers, like that one game, he was just chalking them. Ugh. He had a game seven where he put up 30. And it's it's unfortunate for him. And I think I saw him crying when he was leaving the court. And I understand the emotion. He had the best game of his career, his entire career. And the thing people are going to talk about the most is his turnover after his block shot on James Harden. Um, that's what people are going to talk about the most, which is unfortunate because he had a spectacular game on both sides of the ball. James Harden couldn't do anything offensively. He was in Alcatraz. Lou Dort had that man on clamps. 30 points, too. But it was just that slow release. And shout out to James Harden for getting out there and closing out. James Harden's defense is way better than it was four years ago when he was the laughing stock of the NBA. Um, I was I was happy with the Chris Paul game. Just a couple possessions down the stretch. I just wish that he would have took took control like we know he has been throughout the course of this series and the course of this season. But that last play specifically, the one that ended in Lou Dort taking a shot and they getting blocked. Um, I'm giving a lot of cred credit to I'm getting credit to Dan Tony. 
He knew who he knows who Chris Paul is and how Chris Paul closes out these games. So when Chris Paul gets the ball off the catch, they send a double team immediately. Literally, as soon as he touches the ball, and they get ten, gets the ball at his hands of Shea Gilles Alexander, who who has to launch it across the court to Lou Dort. So shout out to Houston Rockets and, and Mike D'Antoni for clamping up, not even just that last possession, but shoot the possession after that when they try to get the inbound and somehow it goes to Steven Adams instead of the live to Steven Adams that was right there. But the last couple minutes, the Houston Rockets really got it in on the defensive side of the ball, and that is the reason they won this game tonight. Shout out to them. And they're going on to play against the Lakers. And, well, that's a series. Small ball versus the Lakers who run like a two-center lineup. That's going to be something something to see. Um, but I give a lot of respect to Robert Covington. Robert Covington is a meme throughout my YouTube career. But everybody knows, uh, if you've been really watching for a long time, that I really am a fan of Robert Covington. It just so happens in NBA 2K20, he sucks. But... Uh, Robert Covington is an impactful player, man. Offensively, defensively, he had one of the best games of his season today, and they needed it. They needed exactly that. The man was hitting like step, not step back, but side step threes over a contest. We're like, dang, Roko, can you slow down? And yeah, I just wish I wish that Chris Paul would have been able to get a shot up because he has been a clutchest player in the NBA. But it is what it is, man. OKC won heck of a series last season. Uh, especially when you look at that that one graphic that says like OKC had a 0.2% chance of making the playoffs before the season started, according to like ESPN. And then they got all the way to the playoffs and took the Houston Rockets to seven. It's one hell of a season. Um, I'm trying to think of if there's anything else about this game specifically that's worth talking. I don't think it really is. I mean, it was a cool game. I'm more going to talk about OKC's future because I think that is like up in the air right now. Because there are a lot of different directions that this team can go. And if you ask me, I think Sam Presti is going to pull the trigger on maybe a Chris Paul trade this offseason. Um, while his value is still an all-time high. I, okay, not an all-time high because that man was very, very valuable <laughs> when he was in New Orleans. But at a high in the recent years at least. And I think they probably hit the reset. You know? Like what's the ceiling on a team with, with an aging Chris Paul and the players they have now. Probably not very high, but if you keep Shea Gilles Alexander, which they will, you keep Lou Dort, you keep all these draft picks that, picks that you have accumulated, plus an additional draft pick maybe with a Chris Paul trade, uh, Sam Presti's a smart guy. Sam Presti's a smart guy, and I think that that would probably be the route he goes, but anything can happen, right? If he does bring back Chris Paul and bring back Gallinari and say, let's run it back, I wouldn't be surprised either, but I think there's a ceiling on this team, and maybe we just saw that ceiling, you know? Especially with Chris Paul getting older. Now, I know he, he switched to veganism, and that's one of the main reasons he was able to stay healthy this season. But he is still an aging NBA player, an aging point guard at that. And one of the positions that relies a lot on athleticism. Um, so I, if I was him, if I was Sam Presti, I would be like, okay, let's see what we can get for Chris, Christopher Paul while he's still an all-star caliber player. And there are going to be teams out there looking for him. Shoot, I wouldn't be surprised if Milwaukee Bucks looked at him again. Especially because they need somebody to close out games for them. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, it's been rumored that the Knicks want to take a look at him because they just want a culture change. And Chris Paul does that. Chris Paul comes to your team and, well, players are going to play harder. They're going to they're gonna hate Chris Paul probably, but they're going to play harder. They're going to get smarter. And he's going to lead your team to the playoffs a lot of the times, more often than not. Um, but OKC has one of the most curious off seasons ahead of them. We know the untouchable pieces. Though Shea Gilles Alexander wasn't amazing in this series, we know that his potential is skyrocketing, and, and we know that one day he'll probably be an all-star. Lou Dort has showed his value, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Um, but everything else, I think, is kind of up in the air. Darius Baisley. Darius Baisley. I'm not saying he's untouchable, but I think we understand that Darius Baisley has a high ceiling as well. Uh, but everything else should be on the table for Sam Presti and OKC. And, I, and I'm saying as an outsider, I wonder what the OKC fans think. I mean, you may, maybe you're an OKC fan and you're watching this video. What would you think about your offseason? Are you looking to, like, just run it back, keeping Chris Paul with $40 million, 35% of your cap? Or are you looking to, though you may love Chris Paul from this one season, you're looking about thinking about the future? Because I don't really know. You know who's the happiest man in the world, though? James Harden. Because, again, he did not have a good game whatsoever. It's, again, other than the block. The block saves it a lot. Um... But if it's not for that and they somehow lose this game, bro, he was going to get destroyed. And he might still get destroyed um, from the media and everything. I'm not going to destroy him. You know, it's not it's not my character to try to say negative things about players. Um, but he might still get destroyed because notoriously throughout game sevens, he's, he's kind of went blank. And he definitely went blank in this game, man. Possessions where I'm like, okay, where's James Harden? He just wasn't really there. Um, but again, luckily on the defensive side of the ball, they clamped up and got out of there with a victory. Basically, being more clutch than the clutchest team in basketball. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's a W. I think that's the end of the the, the ramble today. 
Uh, I want to get to some off-season stuff, man. The off-season is around the corner. BR is dropping articles daily of stuff. So maybe I'll get back to reading those articles or whatever. I don't know. If you enjoyed it, leave it a like. Shout out to my Insomniacs, baby. This one's coming out before, specifically for you. So let me know in the comment section, Insomniac Gang, because you're real. You're the real deal.